This residence, which has a history of more than 500 years, once housed two families. One had the family name of Zhu, and the other had the family name of Ai Xingjo Luo. And there are many stories about events that took place here. On August 14, 1901, eight foreign powers fought their way into Beijing. Emperor Guangxu fled the Forbidden City, and his favorite concubine, Zhen Fei, met her death. The official court document on this matter contains only a few words on the cause of her death. The report given by Empress Dowager Sushi on the matter states, Last year when the capital fell, the written news of concubine Zhen Fei failed to protect her. In order to maintain her chastity, she killed herself in the court. What she did was truly commendable, so I have decided to give her the posthumous title of highest ranking imperial concubine. However, a different story about the concubine's demise was told by eunuch Zui Yu Gui, who played a key role in her death. On the afternoon of August the 14th, Zui was ordered by Empress Dowager Su Xi to fetch concubine Zhen Fei, who had been placed in confinement for years, and bring her to the Chamber of Harmonious Union. Su Xi told Zhen Fei, foreign troops are fighting their way into our city. We have to flee here for our safety. We cannot take you with us. Zhen Fei responded, you can go to a safer place, but the emperor should stay in the capital to keep things in order. Su Xi snapped, how dare you talk that nonsense when your death is imminent? Zhen Fei replied, I haven't committed any crime punishable by death. Su Xi said, no matter whether you have committed a crime or not, you have to die. Drown her in the well. To unveil this mystery, we need to follow in the footsteps of concubine Zhen Fei as she leads her life in the imperial court. When ancient Chinese looked up into the sky and observed astronomical phenomena, they believed that the brightest star was Polaris, and the other stars surrounding Polaris formed the Polaris Wall. According to legend, the Polaris Wall was the dwelling place of the God of Heaven and his family. As the Emperor claimed to be the son of the God of Heaven, the earthly project of the Polaris Wall was the dwelling place of the Emperor and his family, namely, the Forbidden City. This scroll shows officials being received and tributes being accepted on behalf of the Emperor and the Forbidden City on Chinese New Year's Day. High-ranking nobles, ministers, and diplomatic envoys from all over the world are seen waiting in the square in front of the Hall of Supreme Harmony for the ceremony to begin. However, the throne in the hall is clearly empty, so where is the Emperor? Looking over the palace's many walls, we can see living quarters that are quite different from the buildings in the working area.
In the living quarters, the children of the Emperor, just like any other children outside the palace, are enthusiastically lighting off firecrackers. The Empress and the concubines of the Emperor, like others outside the palace, take care of their children. And just like fathers outside the palace, the Emperor enjoys the happiness brought by a family. The Gate of Heavenly Purity divided the Forbidden City into two parts, the working area in the south and the living quarters in the north. The living quarters consisted of the Palace of Heavenly Purity, the Palace of Earthly Tranquility, the Hall of Union and Peace, and the six palaces on the east and west of these three palaces. And altogether, they constituted the home of the Emperor. The palace where the Emperor slept is called the Palace of Heavenly Purity and the palace where the Empress slept is called the Hall of Her Earthly Tranquility. The Hall of Union and Peace is located between the Palace of Heavenly Purity and the Palace of Earthly Tranquility. These buildings were arranged in this way to convey the meaning that heaven and earth come together, and so do yin and yang. In the Forbidden City, decorative patterns featuring phoenixes can be found only in the Hall of Union and Peace. And the halls are named in this way to indicate that the emperor and his empress and concubines make love and create children. In the winter of 1888, when young girls from all over the country gathered in the imperial garden, they all knew that one of them would become the empress of the Qin Dynasty. The empresses and concubines of the Chinese emperors had mostly come from noble families or families that had accumulated power. However, consolidating imperial rule by becoming related by marriage to noble families often resulted in political crises. Accordingly, in order to prevent relatives of the emperor on the side of his mother or wife from competing with the emperor himself for power, the Ming Dynasty's first emperor, Zhu Yuanzhong, changed the old customs and made it clear that the empress and concubines of the emperor should come from among the common people. In the Qin Dynasty, the empress and concubines of the emperor were mainly selected from among beautiful girls of privileged families under the banner system. During the reign of Emperor Shunzhu, it was stipulated that daughters between 13 and 17 of all the officials of Man, Mongol and Han origin under the banner system should take part in the beauty selection held once every three years. Among these girls, one would be chosen as the empress, while some others would be made concubines of the emperor. In the meantime, this event was also a good opportunity to find wives for the sons and grandsons of the imperial family, as well as other relatives of the emperor. If a girl had not been chosen by the age of 17, she could marry elsewhere. In 1888, after repeated selections and assessments, five girls were finally lucky enough to reach the final stage. They were the daughter of Gui Sheng, Empress Dowager Su Xi's younger brother, two daughters of Du Xing, the governor of Jiangxi, and two daughters of Zheng Xu, senior vice president of the Board of Rights. But none of them knew that the woman standing behind the emperor would be the person who would decide their fates. As to what the selection of the empress and maids of different ranks for Emperor Guangxu was like, Tang Guangqing, a eunuch present at the time, provides this detailed description. The selection took place in the Hall of Manifest Harmony. A Rui jade handle and two pairs of embroidered pouches were prepared beforehand. The girl who received the Rui handle would be the empress, and those who received the embroidered pouches would be the concubines of the emperor. With the Rui jade handle in his hand, Emperor Guangchu approached the eldest daughter of Du Xing and was about to hand it to her. But at this very moment, Empress Dowager Sushi spoke loudly, Emperor! And doing this, she was hinting that the jade handle should be given to Gui Sheng's daughter. Guangxu had no choice but to do as Sushi was hinting. Sushi made Guangxu choose a girl whom he did not love, as she was worried that if the daughters of Duxing became concubines of the emperor, 
they would most likely use all their ingenuity to win the favor of the emperor. Su Xi, therefore, did not allow Guang Chu to choose the concubines himself, but instead instructed him to give the embroidered pouches to Chang Shu's two daughters instead of Du Xin's daughters. As it happened, the girl with whom Guan Chu had fallen in love at first sight was not chosen either as the empress or even as a concubine. So Xi's niece became the empress, and the two daughters of Chang Chu became concubines Jen Fei and Jin Fei, and their fate was changed in an instant. These women who were married to the emperor as empress or as concubines were categorized into different ranks and lived in different halls. During the Ming dynasty, there were 12 ranks. Starting from the reign of Emperor Kanxi, the empress and concubines of different ranks were ranked in accordance with an eight-ranked system. Empress, imperial honored consort, two honorable concubines, four imperial concubines, and six imperial concubines of the third rank. There were three ranks of concubines below the fourth ranked concubine, they were called worthy ladies, ladies-in-waiting, and responders, respectively, and the numbers were not fixed. Altogether, these women made up the emperor's harem, but the numbers of concubines each emperor had varied considerably. Emperor Kan Chi, for example, had 79 concubines, whereas Emperor Guan Chu only had one empress and two concubines. But who could become the empress, the mistress in charge of the living quarters? When the crown prince or the young emperor married for the first time, he did not make decisions for himself. Instead, it was his father or mother, the empress dowager, who had the final say. Therefore, the girl who became the empress was usually not the one the emperor found the most attractive, but the one considered the most suitable for the system of power that operated. On the 27th day of the first lunar month of 1889, when the wedding ceremony of Emperor Guan Chu officially commenced, Empress Long Yu left her home in a sedan chair for the Forbidden City. The bridal chamber was in the Palace of Earthly Tranquility, the palace where empresses in the Ming Dynasty had slept. Since the beginning of the Qin Dynasty, however, it had been used to offer sacrifices to gods during festivals. But when there was a great wedding ceremony in the court, the Dongnuan Chamber would become the bridal chamber, the place where the newly married couple would stay for three days. For Emperor Guangxu, this was not only the day when he would become a husband, it meant that he was going to become the real ruler of the country. Empress Dowager Sushi had declared that as soon as the wedding ceremony was over, she would be giving up politics, and this was the day Emperor Guangzhou had waited for for 15 years. On the night of December the 5th, 1874, Zai Tian, just four years old, had been brought into the Forbidden City. Only a few hours before, Emperor Tongju had died of illness at the age of 19, leaving behind no children. Zai Tian left his warm home and became Emperor Guangxu, beginning a reign that lasted 34 years.
The Palace of Nurturing Success, located in the eastern part of the Imperial Palace, was the dwelling place of crown princes and the Qing Dynasty. When Guangxu was five years old, he was taught how to be an emperor. The young emperor's classroom was inside the Palace of Nurturing Success. Crown princes in the Qing Dynasty could only live in the living quarters of the Forbidden City with their parents up until the age of ten, after which they had to move out of the living quarters to live in the Palace of Nurturing Success or in one of the three remote halls in the south. After they had been conferred with the title of prince, they had to move out of the Forbidden City and take up residence in their own place. It could be said that without doubt, the most durable memory in the mind of a crown prince was the period in which he received his schooling. Before daybreak, the crown prince would begin by learning how to write poems and read classical Confucian texts under the supervision of his teachers. Besides this, a tutor would teach him the man language, while others would teach him horsemanship and archery. He had to study or practice until dusk. The Qing dynasty spared no effort in the education of its crown princes. The imperial family had probably learned something from the experience of the previous imperial family in the Ming dynasty. Although crown princes in the Ming dynasty were supposed to go out and have lessons, the system had not been strictly implemented. So although the twelve Qin emperors were different from each other in terms of innate gifts and potential, most of them administered state affairs diligently. All this should be attributed to the education system arranged for the crown princes. Day in and day out, Guangxu studied, learned, and matured. Although this small courtyard in the Forbidden City may not be particularly attractive, it is nevertheless a very popular tourist destination. From the time of the reign of the Qin Emperor Yongchun, it was used as the bedroom of emperors. This is the only bedroom of an emperor that can be seen in China today, but it looks basically the same as it did when Emperor Guangxu used it. Many people are surprised when they see how small the bedroom is, but the fact is, the first builders of the Forbidden City designed it simply as a place for a temporary rest. After it was upgraded to the bedroom of the emperor, the emperor made the interior furnishing as luxurious as possible to match the dignity of the Son of Heaven. According to records in Furnishings in the Hall of Mental Cultivation, in the second year of the reign of Emperor Tongju, there were 724 articles on display in this room. One bed was placed on each side of the Hall of Mental Cultivation. It was said that the bed on the east side was for the Empress, while the bed in the west was for a concubine. It was also said that the Emperor always lowered the curtains of the two beds exactly at the same time before going to bed, so as to confuse any would-be assassin, because in this way, no one would be able to tell in which bed he was sleeping.
It was a custom to keep early hours in the Forbidden City, and as for how people rose for the day, Hulrum Aur, a female servant of Empress Dowager Sushi, provided details with regard to how Sushi got up in the morning. As soon as the lamp in Sushi's bedroom was on, her female servants would bend over the ground and wish her good luck. After they made the bed for her, they brought a basin of hot water with a silver basin to Sushi. So she wrapped her hands in a hot towel and soaked it in hot water for a long time, and so the water had to be changed twice or thrice. In so doing, the back of the hands and the joints of the fingers were made very comfortable. This was one of the approaches used by Sushi to stay healthy. After that, she washed her face, but this was not a common way of washing her face. To be precise, a hot towel was put on her face. In so doing, the wrinkles on the face would be greatly reduced. After all these procedures were over, Sushi took the seat in front of the dressing table. Word was then passed for a eunuch to comb her hair, paint her eyebrows, powder her face, and rouge her cheeks. Then Sushi would smoke two pipes of snuff and sip a cup of milk tea. She was accustomed to drinking milk from humans and cows. Sushi enjoyed dressing up very much, and she told others that this was important. She often said, If a woman does not have the mood to dress herself up, her life will be dull. After she had washed her face and dressed up, Sushi would sit on the seat of power, by which time Emperor Guangchu and his wife and concubines would be waiting outside. Every morning, the emperor would lead his wife and concubines in paying respects to the empress dowager, a custom that had been a rule in the Forbidden City for several hundred years. On the morning after the wedding ceremony, when Emperor Guangchu paid respects to Sushi, there was a meaningful conversation between the two. Sushi asked with a smile, Where have you come from? Emperor Guanchu replied, From the Hall of Mental Cultivation. Did you pass Jiangsu Gate? Yes. Do you know why this gate is called Jiangsu? I remember that my teacher told me about it once, but I did not work hard enough, so I don't know the whole story. Please tell me. Why is it called Jiangsu Gate? A long-horned male grasshopper is called a Jiangsu, when a Jiangsu vibrates its wings and makes loud noises, many female grasshoppers will come and each of them will give birth to 99 children for the Jiangsu. Our ancestors expressed their wish of having a big family by naming the gate Jiangsu Gate. With that, Su Shi looked at Guangxu and then looked at his Empress Long Yu and stopped smiling. It was a kind of public secret in the court that the emperor and the empress had become estranged. The fact was, Guan Chu had never felt affection toward his wife because the decision to marry her had not been made by himself, but by Su Xi. Su Xi had wanted to consolidate her own power and had been their matchmaker, but this match had resulted in a couple that was estranged. The high walls of the Forbidden City separated the twelve palaces and courtyards from the outside world. These twelve buildings were located symmetrically opposite each other and looked almost the same. They were just like two arms located next to the three rear palaces, and it was here that the Empress concubines lived. Their fate was in the hands of the only man in the living quarters, the Emperor. In some cases, the emperor gave all his love to just one woman who was said to be lucky. In most cases, the women living here had to face the reality of enduring loneliness. As for how the emperor called a concubine to his bedroom, a story had long circulated among the common people. It was said that the concubine was wrapped in a quilt and carried to the bedroom on the back of a eunuch. But was this true? Every afternoon, when the emperor was having his dinner, all his concubines would come to the Hall of Peace and Happiness in the backyard of the Hall of Mental Cultivation and wait there in silence. After the emperor had finished his meal, he would make it clear who he desired to sleep with that night. These lots on which the names of the concubines were inscribed awaited the emperor's choice, and the emperor's hand would decide who he would spend the night with. 
Among the emperors of the Qin dynasty, Emperor Guangchu had the least concubines. He had just his empress and two concubines. However, the name of the empress, the person in charge of the living quarters, was not among the lots. Empress Long Yu often lived in the Hall of State Satisfaction, located to the east of the bedroom of Guangxu in the Hall of Mental Cultivation, but the truth was that this estranged couple had almost never lived together as husband and wife. In the competition for favor from the emperor, concubine Chen Fei easily had an upper hand over the empress. It was a rule in the court that a concubine could not stay with the emperor all night no matter how much favor she had gained from him. But in reality, after sleeping with the emperor, the concubine would not be required to go back to her own bedroom, but would instead sleep in the room next to the emperor's bedroom in the Hall of Mental Cultivation. Shi Wei Chamber, in the Hall of Peace and Happiness beside the Hall of Mental Cultivation, was actually the second bedroom of Chen Fei. Guang Xu had arranged to have this room furnished so that they could live here together. However, this golden period of love was not to last long. Chen Fei was obedient and smart, could write with either her right or her left hand, and liked drawing and singing. She also enjoyed wearing the robe of a bodyguard and dressing like a handsome young man, so as to amuse the emperor. It was said that it was she who introduced photography into the palace, and she very much enjoyed having Guan Chu pose for a photo with her, asking the eunuchs to photograph them. Guang Chu focused his favor on Zhen Fei to the neglect of others, and this greatly irritated Empress Dowager Su Xi, who responded by punishing Zhen Fei for her alleged extravagance. However, the pursuit of photography that had been used to serve as evidence of Jen Fei's misbehavior went on to become Sushi's biggest hobby. After dinner every day, the emperor usually relaxed and entertained himself in various ways by playing musical instruments, playing chess, painting, doing calligraphy, feeding and playing with pets, watching plays, or engaging in sports. This court painting depicts Ming Emperor Xuanzong playing Jaewon, a sport similar to modern golf. Just like the common people, emperors enjoyed various entertainments and hobbies. To a man in the street, hobbies are simply that, and are of little significance. But in the imperial palace, if the emperor indulged himself in one particular hobby or other, the consequence might be so serious that in some cases, the country could end up in crisis. The Ming Emperor Zhang Du was particularly keen on martial arts conferring the title Commander-in-Chief upon himself. In the meantime, however, he was also very interested in doing business, and often disguised himself as a businessman and ran shops and wine houses inside the Forbidden City. The Ming Emperor Jia Jing was fond of pursuing a long life, and so ordered the female servants to get up early to collect dew from the Imperial Garden, which he would then use to make immortality pills. The Ming Emperor Wan Li did not receive any of his ministers for decades and lived a secluded life in the palace. His biggest hobby was accumulating wealth, a pursuit that saw the entire salt tanks collected from the rich and popular south buried under the ground in the imperial palace. The Ming Emperor Tianji was a very good carpenter and it was said that he once designed a golden dragon which could spray water and play with a pearl. He was so caught up in his hobby that he asked his chief eunuch Wei Zhongshen to attend to state affairs on his behalf. The hobbies of the Ming emperors certainly made their lives rich and colorful, but they also quickened the complete collapse of the Ming dynasty. 
the new masters of the Forbidden City were from somewhere between the Chongbai Mountains and the Heilong River in northeast China. The Man people tend to be agile and brave, so the leisure activities of Qin emperors were characterized by a strong spirit of martialism. This is the Mulan enclosure, a hunting ground of emperors. And it was here during nearly 200 years in the early and middle Qin dynasty that emperors led 10,000 soldiers, along with members of the Man, Mongol, and Han nobilities, in hunting. This was a necessary military exercise in peacetime, and also the most appropriate outdoor activity for improving relations between the nobilities. When winter came, an entertainment that featured unique man characteristics would begin. Skating was in fact the most popular recreation for the imperial family in the Qin dynasty, and on each occasion they went skating, more than 1,200 offices and men participated. Their skating was smooth and accomplished, with some of them posing beautifully while moving at great speed. Others pleased the emperor with their ability to shoot small balls hanging on the gates with arrows. From the time of the emperor's wedding, everyone in the Forbidden City earnestly looked forward to the birth of his baby. In current regulations concerning the imperial palace, stipulations were specified regarding the pregnancy of the empress or concubine. If the empress or concubine was pregnant, her allowance for meals and other items would be increased by 50% and her natural mother could take care of her in the palace. If the empress gave birth to a baby, she would receive 1,000 tails of silver and 300 bolts of dress fabric when her baby was one month old. If a concubine gave birth to a baby, she was also entitled to relevant treatment. In ancient China, the succession to the throne was carried out basically in accordance with this principle. The eldest son of the empress was the first heir. If she did not have a son, the eldest son of the concubine would be the first heir. If no concubine had given birth to a son, an adopted son from a relative of the imperial family or the emperor's younger brother would be the first heir. Emperor Yongzheng initiated a system in which the crown prince was selected secretly, and because of this, greater importance was attached to the capabilities of the heir. Even so, one fundamental prerequisite was not changed. Unless circumstances made an alternative necessary, the heir was to be the son of the emperor. Being a crown prince naturally meant becoming the emperor in the future. So naturally, the empress and concubines wanted to give birth to a boy who would become a crown prince. So while the living quarters appeared to be a quiet place, in reality, it was a place full of jealousy, hatred, and even murder. One day in 1475, 29-year-old Ming Emperor Shen Zun got up and looked into the mirror. To his surprise, he saw several white hairs on his head and could not help but sigh. I'm getting old, but I still have no sons. On hearing this, Zhang Ming, the eunuch who was doing the emperor's hair, suddenly knelt down and reported a secret which he had been keeping for five years.
Shan Jun had given almost all his love to his concubine Wan Guifei, who was 17 years his senior, and in order to dominate the living quarters, Wan Guifei had forced all the pregnant concubines to abort. Unfortunately, after her own son had died very young, she had never again become pregnant, but what she did had nearly deprived Shen Jun of the possibility of ever having a son. One day in early autumn five years before, when Shen Jun was reading, he saw a palace woman surnamed Ji, who was the daughter of a Yao official in Guangxi. She was smart and charming and answered the emperor's questions in a fine manner. Shan Jun found her attractive and made love to her, and she became pregnant. People who spied for concubine Wan Guifei had found this out with ease and had immediately reported on the matter to her. Wan Guifei ordered Ji to abort the baby, but even this did not force Ji to do so. Zhang Ming, a eunuch along with other people in the palace who had felt discontent over the dominance of Wan Guifei, gave a false report to Wan Guifei that Ji was seriously ill. According to a rule of the imperial palace, Ji had to be sent to An Lu Hall near Beihai Park to die. As a result, under the protection of many people from the palace, Ji managed to give birth to a son and brought him up without telling the people that his father was the emperor. After finding out the truth, Xian Jun immediately dispatched some people to get his son back to the palace. Just a month later, Ji died, and Zhang Ming too died a violent death, and it was said that Wang Guifei was involved in their deaths. The boy, however, survived the cruel killings in the Forbidden City's living quarters, and 13 years later, he became emperor. Traditionally, the Chinese people believed that to have many sons was to have many blessings. On the bed in the bridal chamber in the Hall of Earthly Tranquility, there was a quilt of a type called Bai Zhe Bei, meaning 100 sun quilt, and it was of course an expression of this traditional idea in the imperial palace. The classical illusion of Bai Zhe comes from the Book of Psalms, which prayed King Wenwan of the Zhou Dynasty for having many children. In the Bai Zhe picture, Homophones and puns were used, implying that the emperor would have many children, so that his family would be prosperous and last for a long time. Starting from Nuar Ha Chu, the founder of the Qing dynasty, the family of Ai Xing Zhuo Luo had been very large. However, by the time the emperor Xianfeng ascended the throne, it was at a time when the dynasty was suffering from domestic trouble and foreign invasion and the imperial family had become weak due to a lack of children. It was here in the third lunar month of the sixth year of the reign of Emperor Xianfeng that his concubine Lan Guiren gave birth to a son, Zai Chun. Because the eldest son of Xianfeng had died very young, Zai Chun became the only successor to the throne. As a result, Lang Guiren, whose status was originally not high at all, eventually became Empress Dowager Sushi, the woman who became the de facto ruler of China for nearly 50 years. The only son of Sushi, Emperor Tongju, died of illness shortly before his 20th birthday, and he did not leave behind any sons. Guangxu, who ascended the throne as the younger brother of Emperor Tongju, also had no children. To an imperial family, the lack of a male descendant was the most bitter blow, an ominous warning that the dynasty was coming to an end. At the same time, China was in the midst of its saddest years. 
the young emperor Guangxu was anxious to carry out his far-reaching reforms. This is the earliest film of the Imperial Palace preserved in the United States Library of Congress. It was shot by an American in 1903 when the palace was open to foreigners. In 1898, four years before this film was shot, the 103-day constitutional reform initiated by Emperor Guangxu suddenly came to an end when Empress Dowager Sushi returned secretly to the Forbidden City from the Summer Palace and had Emperor Guangxu placed under house arrest. Sushi had all state power in her hands again. On October 21st, 1908, seven years after concubine Zhen Fei had died, the weak Guan Chu passed away. Just one day later, Empress Dowager Sushi also died. The Forbidden City was just like a huge stage on which dramas unfolded, but it was a stage from which the thick theater curtain was never lifted. In the late autumn of 1908, another boy was sent to the Forbidden City to become China's last emperor. But within just a few years, the Forbidden City was no longer to be the home of any emperor. <laughs> 